All right. Howdy, howdy, everyone. Welcome to the McCarroll Real Estate Show for, what is it, July 21st. I should know that. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for tuning in. As always, we are here to give you all the perspectives and our impressions on the market and investing, uh, what we're keeping an eye on, uh, you know, to help inform you and educate you. Before we do go on, of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we do ask that uh, you subscribe, hit that, sort of smash that subscribe button, as my son likes to say. And, uh, you know, that will help us get our numbers up and help us just just give more information to more and more clients and people. Uh, you know, if, if you get any value out of it, we highly recommend sharing it with a friend or family member. Uh, you would be surprised when you talk to people uh, that just think investing is something that they can't do, but they sure can. And we are here to show you how. As always, joined. I'm joined by our fantastic team. Uh, Tabitha is still away. Cam is still down in Mexico, but we do have Matt Greiner. Hello, hello. Looking sharp with his new haircut. And of course, uh, investor and agent superior, Aro Hussein. Hey, everyone. Uh, Aro's got a really interesting property. I'm, I'm kind of excited to go on a deep dive of that because because uh, it's a little bit different and bigger than what we usually do. And of course, running our back end, uh, Tamara and Shannon, our amazing administrators, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Promotion and Marketing himself, Andrew. So yeah, once again, thanks everybody for tuning in to the McCarroll Real Estate Show. Uh, as always, we are going to take a look at the market. We're going to do a little bit of a dive on obviously the big interest rate hike that we spoke about last week. We will be doing a little bit of a deeper dive. I wanted to kind of look at um, inflation and just, uh, you know, uh, we've also got a really great report. Some Cam sent me a report from his favorite analyst, Ben Rabideau. So we'll be taking a look at just a couple of the charts from that as well. Uh, but in the meantime, I think that maybe we should get on to one live deal. So I will pass it off to one of the fellows uh, who would like to go first, guys. I can go first. Um, I actually have an appointment at 12, so I would like to get mine out of the way. So that way there we go. If I need to. Um, so I'll quickly share my page. As Adam mentioned, it's a, this one's a unique kind of uh, property and uh, the type of conversion it is it is a little bit of a different um, I mean I guess it's still a burr right so that's what you know uh, a lot of us are kind of looking for it's a but very it's a, burr. It's a very, little very. bit bigger bigger mm -hmm. burr um, so it's a 17 unit conversion opportunity uh, currently the building is a medical office building uh, but it's in a zone that allows for 100% residential conversion uh, it's in the downtown core so very walkable to um, you know, James Street, King Street. This is basically your downtown corridor where it starts. Um, and then that's obviously where the LRT line is going. So it's very conveniently located. Um, there's all, also potential for building up as well. Again, this is one of the, I would say, the most favorable zonings in the downtown area, um, which allows for multiple uses, not, not just residential. It's great that it allows for 100% residential, but there are other uses that you can operate uh, from there. Um, and you can build up. Uh, if, the, if the lot size is enough, um, you'll obviously have to go through site plan in order to build, build up. Anything that you do that's adding, uh, an additional uh, adding square footage to the property or the building, you have to get site plan approval. But if you're working within the envelope, so within the structure, uh, you don't need site plan approval. You can get that exempted. Uh, so the goal would be to do that without having to go through site plan because that takes more time. Uh, but if you are somebody that's looking to do something bigger like that, that option is available here. So as is, the building is uh, a medical office. The, the previous owner did some work uh, that they wanted to turn it into something um, like an emergency shelter units. Again, many different uses that you could do there. Uh, that's what he chose, uh, but he never completed the project. Uh, but throughout him going through that process, he did have to complete an environmental study. So phase one, phase two, and also phase three, there was some contamination that they have to remediate, which they have done, which is great. Uh, here's a couple of pictures of the inside. Again, it's, a, it's an empty shell. Uh, it's got a nice big corridor staircase leading up to the second level, uh, and then also going to the basement. The basement's huge. Um, 
it's a it, it could be usable but you know in order to create apartments in the basement you'd need natural light and there aren't any windows at the current moment so i put that as storage storage lockers um, there's obviously other things that you could do down there but just for this purpose we'll just call it storage um, we'll just quickly kind of talk about the purchase price that's what they're asking price i have it at two million we'll play around with that a little bit uh, at the end see what the numbers look like but just to kind of uh, again to make the numbers work that's the purchase price that i've chosen now that could be depending on what the seller's motivations are, you could probably get that for less. Um, but if they're not really motivated, then I don't think they'll sell it for that price. Uh, but this is something that I would offer as a purchase price if I was to do this myself. Just again, just to make the numbers work. So on the purchase for deals like this, um, you can go private financing because it, you, it's going to be difficult to get conventional financing on something like this because obviously it's vacant. So there's no rental income coming in. Uh, most banks are going to look at it as a high risk um, kind of um, property. So they're not likely going to uh, finance this one. So you're going to have to go private. And there are private lenders out there that are looking for deals like this, where it's a conversion, uh, where they'll, they'll look at the, the, the project as a whole from start to uh, finish. And they'll, they'll lend based on the after repair value. So when you're going for financing on something like this, you, we're gonna have to do an appraisal. Uh, and on that appraisal, it'll kind of project what the value would be when the renovations are complete. And based on that, you'll get the financing. So private money, 9%, uh, there's 3% uh, fees for broker and lender fees. Uh, so something like this to close it and hold it for 18 months, that's the projected timeline in order to complete it, start to finish you're looking at about 710,000. So that's your down payment, 400K, which is 20% down. Um, then obviously your fees, carrying costs for the 18 months, 216,000. Closing costs, which uh, adds up to around seven, 710,000. So that's something you would need right off the top. Um, well, the holding costs, you don't necessarily need off the top, but it's good to have because you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to, you know, you want to make sure that you have that in case the project runs that whole entire 18 months. Uh, and you don't want to be scrambling last minute trying to get funds for you know, holding costs. So I would definitely say to have that at first. Um, and then obviously, as we go through the due diligence, we confirm that, that we can do 17 units. Uh, and then we also confirm the rental cost. Um, for something like this, I usually go 80K per unit. Uh, and then obviously some contingencies. Um, so here we have 1.8 million uh, for your rental. And you don't have to come up with all of that yourself, right? Again, there are financing uh, available for stuff like this, construction loans and things like that. So for this project, you would need about 600,000 to do your initial rental. Uh, and then you could actually finance the 1.2. Uh, it's here somewhere. Yep. So right down here. So you're out of the 1.8 million, 600K is coming from you. 1.2 is being financed through another private lender or it's, it could be the same one. And th this is the broker that would be setting it up, right? And this is a broker that I've worked with in the past. They've done deals like them, this themselves. So they understand the process uh, and they, again, look at it from an ARV standpoint, right? They're looking at it, what the future value would be and they lend it based on that. Um, any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Everything? No, I mean, it's a, it's a big project. It's a lot to go on, but it's, uh, it's very interesting. Okay, cool. If there are questions, I guess we'll jump back later. Mm -hmm. uh, but so that would be the plan in terms of the rental. Uh, and then that's your borrowing cost, right? Again, this is annualized, right? Um, you're not going to borrow 1.2 right off the top. So that this number will be lower, but just for the, you know, uh, running the numbers, obviously, if it's higher and the numbers still work, obviously it'll work if it's lower because you're not, they're not going to give you 1.2 right away, right? They'll give it to you in stages. So you'll pay interest on only the amount that you're borrowing, right? So it's not, and this is right now it's annualized, right? 10% for the whole year. Um, so just keep that in mind. So that's what your monthly payment. You estimating the timeline on this. 18 months. 18 months. Okay. Yep. And that's already because the, the, all of the environmentals are already done. 
Uh, yeah. you, you know, you need that site plan. You can avoid the site plan, but in that area, is that is that a, a TOC? Is that why you can build D1. up? D1. Okay. Yeah. So you don't need any parking requirements uh, for up to 12 units. So more than 12, you need about 0.3 per unit, which yeah. we have. Yep. And what's your ARV coming in at? You just want to get to the exciting part. Of course <laughs> I do. Of course um, I do. This is, this yeah, is so, okay. Yeah. So, so that's your reno, right? Um, yep. okay, where, where are we? So here's your reno. Uh, yep. That's your borrowing cost for the reno. So you're coming up with 600K and you're paying another 180 plus your construction insurance. Uh, you're at 795. So you, you need 710 for the down payment and holding costs and closing costs. And for the reno, um, with your borrowing cost for the 1.2, plus the 600K up front, you're looking at another 795. So nice. total you need for this project is 1.5 million roughly, just over 1.5 million. Um, and then we'll jump to the rents first because I wanna, I wanna show you how I get to the ARV um, before we jump to the ARV, mm -hmm. rental income. So we have 10 two bedroom units. Again, these are uh, my estimation as I'm walking through the building, but during the due diligence period, that's something we can confirm. Um, if it's going to be 10 units that are two bedrooms or you know, nine units or 11 units, uh, that's something we can confirm during the due diligence period. Uh, and for something like this, we usually go uh, 30 to 60 days conditional, uh, and that's 30 to 60 business days. So that gives you more than enough time to do your drawings, uh, to do any other uh, environmental studies that you need to do, figure out your financing, and also we can figure out how many units um, or what the ARV would be. Uh, so they, these all kind of play into that same strategy to figure out, confirm the details, right? Um, and at that point, we'll know exactly how many units uh, and whether they're you know, two bedrooms or one bedrooms. Right now I have 10 two bedrooms and seven one beds. And the way this would work is uh, I'm basically doing what the appraiser would be doing. So what they do is they come in they take take a look at the building as is, uh, and they'll took it. They'll, they'll take a look at your plans. So they'll see, okay, what are you planning on doing here? Okay, I'm planning on doing this many units. Okay, let's look at the drawings. And it doesn't have to be like uh, architectural drawings. It could be a sketch. Uh, and as he is walking through the building, he'll kind of look at it and see if that's feasible. Uh, and then he'll go back and make a report. Um, so he does uh, uh, entire comparable in terms of buildings that have sold. Uh, units that have been rented out and so the idea is to get the average rent so they'll look he'll look for um, what the average rent is in that neighborhood for a two-bedroom and then he'll say okay the average rent is 1900 for a two-bedroom uh, for a one bedroom it's 1500 and these are he's a, he's comparing apartment buildings he's not comparing um, like your you know triplexes or duplexes he's not looking at those because those don't, don't really compare to apartment buildings so He's comparing everything that's been, you know, rented out and sold in that area, and then he comes up with how much rent you can generate from the building as 17 units. So these are the average rents. So roughly 30,000, and then if there's any storage lockers, he'll uh, calculate that in there as well. Also parking. Um, so then he'll say, okay, uh, this is the uh, net operating income, uh, and then usually they like to use close to 30 percent for your expenses. Again, for newer build apartments, you're not going to have that high of an expense ratio, um, but that's what they like to see on appraisal uh, to kind of come to a net operating income. So on something like this, that's your NOI uh, for the year. And then they have a chart actually. So right here, I have 5% cap rate, but on their appraisal report, they'll have a chart and they'll say, okay, if the cap rate is 5.5, this is the value. Cap rate is 5%, this is the value, 4.75, 4.5, all the way down to 4%. So it's kind of like a scale, uh, depending on what the lender feels comfortable lending at. Um, some lenders might say, okay, we'll lend you at a four cap. That just means you're getting more money. Uh, your building evaluation is higher uh, versus some other lenders, they might say, okay, we, we really feel comfortable lending it at a five cap. Uh, that will bring your evaluation down just because they feel more comfortable. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the property is worth if you're going to sell it because these buildings, they do sell around uh, 3.8, some, in some cases, even three, three and a half cap. So that just means that if you, go, if you go to sell the building, the value of the building is much higher. Or 
not necessarily the value, but what somebody's willing to pay for it is higher than what the bank's willing to appraise it at. Right. That makes sense. Yep. Um, okay, so 5% cap rate, uh, that's your net operating income, and that gives you an evaluation of 5.3 million. So on the appraisal report, you'll have that evaluation, and then that gets sent back to the lender uh, and the broker. The broker looks at it. Uh, he puts a package together, sends it to the lender, and then the lender lends based on this value. So they'll say, okay, the ARV is 5.3 million. We feel comfortable lending you um, 1.6 million at this rate. Plus, we potentially will give you the, the renovation cost, which is another 1.2, because that still puts them under the 80% loan to value of the after repair value. So that's how they look at it from a lending perspective. Um, once the property is completed, that's when you would move it into a conventional loan. You do have a bunch of options when you're going to refi on a building like this. Obviously, you'll have to get it rented out. You'll have to show the income coming in. Also show them your expenses. Uh, and they're, when they look at the, um, when you're looking to do the refi, they will calculate additional things that you might not have in there. For example, let's say you manage the building yourself. You probably should get a property management company to do it, but let's say you manage it yourself. So this $1,800 per month, uh, you're saving, that's your additional cash flow, but the bank's gonna still add that in there. They're going to say, we wanna see a property management fee in there because that's just how they run their numbers. So they wanna be around that 30% mark, uh, just around that. Um, and again, if you don't have any capital expenditures because you build this thing brand new, that's additional cash flow in your pocket, but the bank will use that, right? They'll say, okay, we want to see CapEx, we want to see maintenance, management, vacancy, obviously you have your insurance. Um, so those are the soft costs that we always talk about. Uh, and then obviously your hard costs are the exact expenses, property tax, and also insurance. Uh, so they look at all that, they look at your rental income coming in, uh, and then you have options in terms of the refi because you can go with CMHC insured on buildings like this that will allow you to go more than 80% loan to value. Uh, and the amortization actually goes up as well. You can go 35 year amortization. I've heard some people get 40 year AMS as well, uh, but that's something we have to confirm with the broker. But just again, for running the numbers on this one, I use 35, uh, 30, um, 30 year amortization. Obviously, if you go higher, your cash flow will be a little bit better. Uh, and obviously, if you go low, uh, higher on the LTV, you're going to pull out more money, but your borrowing cost is a little bit higher, so that's going to impact your cash flow. Uh, also, interest rate, uh, CMHC insured inter interest rates are a little bit different too. So that's something we can also look at later down the road. But again, to keep things simple, as we're running the numbers initially, I like to do 5%, 30-year AM, 75 loan to value. Uh, with that, you're leaving in 319000 out of your initial $1.5 and the building cash flow is $746. Um, depending on how many investors are involved, that would be your capital requirement. Here's a little breakdown of your appreciation on year one, cash on cash return, and mortgage pay down. Um, I do wanna see, just play around with the numbers a little bit. Can you see my screen still? Yep. Yeah, you can yep. see the spreadsheet here. Yep. Okay, so let's say, um, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, I leave in, you know, 300, where am I? Uh, where did I go? Sorry. Oops, lost. Yeah, so I'm leaving in around 319,000. And I say, okay, you know what? I wanna pull out more money. Um, we can adjust this or we can adjust our purchase price, right? So again, somebody asked me recently, it's like, okay, how do we even know what to offer for, for a building like this? I work it backwards, right? So I do this calculation and I say, okay, this is how much money is being left in at that purchase price. So if I, if I want to pull out more money, obviously, you know, I could try to control the renovation costs, which you might not know exactly what it is. So you don't want to take a chance on that. Why don't, and especially now that the market's a little bit different. Why don't, why don't I just offer them less money? And if they're motivated enough, they'll take it, right? So I adjust the purchase price at 1.9, you're leaving in, 100,000 less, right? So we can adjust, play around with those numbers. And then also if we, let's say the cap rates, we can play around these numbers as well because this projected is 5%, but what if you get a four and a half cap, right? That just means your building evaluation is even higher. I just wanna show you exactly how much higher it would be uh, because it's a, it's a pretty big difference. Right now we have 
person cap rate and the value is 5.3 million. But if we change that to four and a half, which a lot of people were getting not too long ago, um, and again, 18 months from now, we don't really know where the interest rate's going to be. So that could be different at that time. Uh, and at a four and a half cap, you're looking at 5.9 million. So that's a 600K difference between five cap and four and a half cap. And then you're actually pulling additional money out. Obviously your cash flow gets impacted, uh, but if you can adjust the 35 to 35 year amortization, again, these are all things that we can figure out during the due diligence period, but I just wanna kind of show you what, um, like what changing one thing, or let's say, because this happened to me before when we did the, the church conversion, we initially ran the numbers, it looked decent, but then it turned up to be even better than what it was because the rent's gone up, um, and also the, the cap rate, we projected it at 6%, but um, the refi came in at 4.5%. So the interest rate kind of, you know, making it a little bit challenging because that's going to impact your cash flow. Uh, but if you're okay with leaving more capital in, especially on a deal like this, um, you know, for, it's a fraction of the value of the property, right? If the property is valued at 5.3 million and you're leaving in 300K, I don't even know what that, percentage works out to be, but it's very minimal. Something like this, um, again, it's a bigger, it's a bigger scale per project, uh, but you know, I've, I've been getting a lot of questions about it. So I thought I'd share something like this. If you do have more questions and want to find out more, reach out and uh, we might do another workshop soon. Yeah, that's great. Speaking of, that's actually a great segue. Um, you and Cam did do an actually deeper dive into bigger projects like this. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm sure Andrew will drop a link in the chat. Um, if you are, I see a lot of new names here, which is great. Welcome to the show. If you uh, are interested and you have not signed up on our VIP section, you will have access to all of those spreadsheets, the one that Aro is using. And they're really powerful because they do auto-populate, as you saw. You make one change and you can really kind of play with the numbers and and uh, you know, I know uh, all of us like to kind of be conservative when we do our numbers. And then it's fun to kind of say, well, best case scenario, what happens here and how does that shift things? So, uh, yeah, that's a really great, really interesting project. I, I'm really fascinated by the bigger stuff. Um, and Aro, you're in the middle of doing one yourself. So, you know, you have uh, not just experience doing it with clients, but now you're you're deep in it yourself, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's yeah. uh, it's actually interesting because like. You know, I was thinking, I was talking to the engineer recently, um, not the engineer, the designer, um, because I was kind of worried a little bit that, hey, like maybe I can't get approval for, you know, eight units. But he's like, no, this is, this is a slam dunk. Like, obviously he's done other projects and he's like, you know, that could be a little bit challenging, but he said, no, this one's a slam dunk, especially because of the zoning, right? Mm -hmm. That D1 zoning is one of the most like favorable zoning in terms of uh, residential use or any other use, actually, to be honest, uh, because when you look at the list of permitted uses, it's really long and the requirements, there's like no parking requirement. It's very um, development friendly right? because it's in the downtown core. Right. And that's one of the newer zones that came into being about five, five to seven years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Great. Cool. Awesome. So if you do have interest in that, if you have a whole bunch of friends that want to pool your resources, uh, we can talk uh, joint ventures, JVs as well. Um, I know I don't have access to that much capital, but I would love to get into something like that. It's a really intriguing property. Uh, great stuff. So we, uh, we're we going to move on to, uh, I, I'm not sure, Matt, did you want to do your deal now or did you want to wait a bit? Yeah, it's totally up to you. If you want okay. me to go, I'm happy to go. Uh, why don't we actually do the market update and then we'll do our deals. My deal is pretty straightforward. Uh, yours is a little more complicated. So we will move into our weekly market update. And I do want to kind of uh, talk to the guys about this too, just kind of get their impression. Um, it's one thing to get the numbers and to look at the numbers and understand the numbers. And it's another thing to actually speak to boots on the ground, so to speak, people that are actually out there, uh, you know, because sometimes we do have a, a slightly different perspective or it reinforces what we're seeing out here. So uh, our usual weekly market update, as we have seen, we have definitely seen listings going up. There's a little spike in the last couple of weeks again, and sales are down, which is we've known for a little while now. That's reflected in the price drops. Um, it's it, it kind of it's very similar in a lot of ways to me to the 2017 kind of boom that we went through, where 
everybody went uh, went a little bonkers and then they missed that window and people were still listing. So when I was lo- thinking about these numbers, I did find it interesting that Cam had also said, you know, towards this, what usually happens at the beginning of the, these big shifts is there are a lot of people that have to sell. They don't have a choice and they kind of skew some of the numbers in terms of listings or numbers going down because they just they don't have a choice. Maybe they bought a few months earlier. Uh, you know, they got caught in the price uh, drop and now they're just, you know, they're they're in a way of selling. They, they have to sell. So as we go through this, uh, those people will get weeded out. And I kind of feel like we're going to see a little bit more stabilization in prices. And some of the uh, stats that I have here will bear that out as well. So Cam did send me, he uh, he signs up for, I know he's a big Ben Rabideau fan. Uh, ben is, I believe, a, a, an analyst and he started uh, his own company. And so I just, uh, he sent me this report and I just wanted to pull a couple of these charts to help you understand what's going on. I found them very interest, interesting. Now this was done about a week before the rate hike. And that's why it says outsized rate hike on deck next week, but the end is in sight. Um, and that's an interesting quote. We'll dig into that too. For all the talk of recessionary concerns, the Canadian economy continues to chug along just fine. Sure, employment slipped a little in June on the back of a suspiciously large decline in self-employed workers, but the unemployment rate fell below 5% for the first time on record. At the same time, wage growth hit the highest levels in over 20 years. If we set aside the 18 months immediately after the start of the pandemic, which obviously wreaked havoc on official wage data. So I do find it interesting. There was that little spike in the unemployment rate, as you can see. Uh, but the uh, the other interesting thing I found is now the hourly wage is actually going up. So uh, this is kind of ties into me with uh, uh, interest rates and with inflation. Um, and we'll, we'll get there as well. But uh, a couple of other charts here. So this was an interesting one. The monthly mortgage payment on a typical home. Unfortunately, that's as big as I can make that. But you can see within nine months, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a frame of reference of the price of the house. I guess it depends on how much you're leaving in. But for example, if your mortgage payment was around $2,000, nine months later, you're up over three. You're around $3,200. Uh, just to kind of indicate what's happening to homeowners or people looking to get a mortgage. And I do believe that obviously that's going to affect how many people are shopping for homes and their affordability. Um, the other thing that was interesting here was the Toronto market. So he, he focused quite a bit on the Toronto market in this. He focused on Toronto, Vancouver, and the Alberta market too. Uh, I just kind of cherry picked the Toronto ones, but in June, uh, Toronto slumped, the home sales slumped about 4.7% seasonally adjusted, and they're down 41% last month to register the lowest June tally since the 1990s. Uh, you know, things were crazy for a long time. We knew that there were a ton of sales and bidding. Now we're kind of getting back to regular levels, maybe even a little below, a little below. But because the last two years have been so unprecedented, it's you know it's always tough to get context of what it is that we're looking at. And you can see from the right hand chart, uh, the bottom right, the June home sales did come down quite a bit. What I do find interesting is you know it's still not completely tanked, but it is low. Um, you know, it's because some people I know are forecasting doom and gloom and not expecting much going on. Uh, the last chart that I did pull here was the monthly change in the MLS home price index. Um, so the home price index, I'm, I'm, I can't remember, maybe one of you guys can help me how they calculate that. I don't know if that's just an overall average of all of Canada. Um, We're not sure. Yeah, give me... That's fine. You can look that up. Um, so, so that just kind of said you could see the home price index dropped below about three, three and a half. Uh, it's so price just reflecting prices went down. But he did uh, find that that's kind of understated because the median prices are down quite a bit. So uh, again, I'm not sure if this is just the Toronto market, but it just all indicates everything that we've known and talked about that prices are on the decline. So I did want to check in with the guys here and, and you know, what are you kind of feeling out there, uh, out there with your buyers, looking at houses, offering on places? Uh, what's your sense of what's going on in the market? Definitely a sound lot market. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. So definitely a more of a balanced market. Um, 
maybe a little bit on the buyer's market side too, like in terms of sentiment wise. But if I, if you actually look at the data, it's probably still a balanced market. Um, but a lot of buyers are, at least for me, I feel like they're picking up some good deals. If they're actually making the transaction, like making the offers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people are kind of like waiting to see what happens. But, you know, just I've had clients picked up, you know, some bird projects that are in the 600s, right? Like before we were well into seven, some, in some cases, even 800s. So to pick up something like that in the 600s, to me, that's a good deal. And one quote like that I recently saw that kind of stood out was like, um, I might be saying it wrong, but it just basically said interest rates are temporary, right? It's going to go up and down. But uh, you getting into a home and the purchase price that you buy it for, that's permanent, right? Uh, so you entering into the market at a lower price point, that's not going to change. But your interest rate that you're getting into it for now, that over time will change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Matt, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, definitely a lot more buying opportunities. I think there's a lot of sellers that are either at the point where they've had a good run for the last couple of years and they've been, you know, long term. Uh, portfolios that they've built that they're looking to liquidate because the interest rates are going up too much and they just don't want to deal with the headaches. So I've been seeing a lot of sellers with that type of motivation. Um, and then in terms of purchase prices, there's a lot more room for negotiation, which is really good. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of stuff stay on market. You know, when it becomes that type of buying opportunity, they're at nearly 60 days on market. Um, that's when we're starting to see a lot more negotiating happening in terms of pricing. I would say for stuff that's just on the market or hasn't really passed that 30 to 45 day mark, then that room to negotiate is much tighter because normally those properties are priced a little bit more sharply comparatively to their competition that's been sitting on market longer. So it really just comes down to breaking down the numbers of what's recently sold in, the, in a very short period of time. My comps aren't going back further than the last 30 days since the market seems to shift, you know, almost every week now. <laughs> we seem to see some sort of drop or some sort of increase in some subsections. Um, so it's, I feel like everyone's starting to get it, but I think sellers and a lot of realtors, the ones that aren't as keen as we are, on all the stats are pretty slow to react to the change. And they're still operating with the same mentality that they had for the last two years. So I think by September, we should see that kind of, that shift finalized uh, with the final interest rate hike for this year around that time. And then probably end up seeing a bit of stagnation in pricing come the fall is my thought. I, I actually totally agree. Um, I do think that I, I even noticed personally that Prices have started to, in terms of that decline, they've actually started to slow down. I feel like we're, you know, just starting to reach the bottom of that pricing well. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's that old adage, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. So uh, there, are, there are a couple of things that I talk to about with clients a lot. And uh, one of the big ones is, you know, some of them are thinking about if they're selling or they're buying, uh, the prices have gone down, which is great for a buy, but then they're also thinking, well, what if they go down another 10 or 20 or 30 K? Uh, sure. What if, what if they don't, what if, you know, what if we, we turn fairly quickly and we start seeing a slight rise again, you know, you don't want to be chasing things. And at some point you do have to take the plunge and, you know, and, and as we always, as we always say, if you, you're planning on holding it for at least five years, the market's going to rebound. And further to Aro's point, interest rates are going to eventually go down again. They're not going to keep going up. They fluctuate as it goes. Um, you know, it's the blunt instrument that they have to try to uh, get inflation under control right now, just whapping people on the heads with these, say, stop spending money. Uh, so with that in mind, I did actually want to take a little bit of a dive into uh, the interest rates and what's going on right now, because I did uh, did find some interesting things. And there's kind of a very vague general consensus of where we're at with interest rates. So the Bank of Canada is forecasting inflation to reach 8% over the next few months before beginning to decline to 4.6 next year. That's a very interesting number to me because that's almost, they're saying inflation is going to almost cut in half by next year. Now, what I did find when I did a lot of readings is most economists agree. Most economists actually do agree. Now, how they get there, that's million dollar question but uh you know cibc's senior economist 
Karine Charbonneau said the Bank of Canada's forecast for inflation declining over the next year is hinged largely on global factors, which are outside of their control. Those are the same factors that explain the majority of the bank's inflation forecast errors over the past year, suggesting they're also the hardest to predict. And while there are some signs of cooling in the Canadian housing market, as we just demonstrated, which would bring down overall inflation, shelter costs account for a relatively small portion of the projected decline of inflation over the next year. I found that interesting as well. So they're kind of to indirectly toying with the real estate market, thinking that that will make a big difference. But basically, they're saying it's it's not a huge factor. You know, things like war and the price of oil and you know, uh, the supply chain problems are in June, average national housing prices declined by 1.8% year over year. Uh, so even with that drop, we're saying from last June to this June, it's not a huge difference. I mean, we did have a, a you know, a giant surge in prices through the winter. Uh, but, you know, your house has not devalued overall that much. Uh, another one. So there was quite a bit of talk about the inflation rate and how it was similar to the big hyper, not hyperinflation, but the, the period in the 70s and the 90s or the 80s. So James Orlando, senior economist with TD Bank, first started tracking the similarities between today's inflation period and the highs of the previous generation back in April. Then he noted that the causes of inflation today, surging food, fuel and shelter prices, were the same ones driving the Canadian prices higher over two distinct periods, one in the early 70s and the later decades stretching into the 80s. Current inflation is very much what just like what happened back then, he tells Global News. Now, that would be really alarming because if you remember, we got up to 17 to 24 percent interest rates. But there was another interesting piece of that. Indeed, when the Bank of Canada had to raise its policy rate above the 20 percent mark in the 80s, following the U.S. Federal Reserve on the, quote, war on inflation, the economic pain was intense. The unemployment rate rose to 12 percent in 83. Lee says the only reason interest rates had to go so high back then was that the Bank of Canada didn't recognize the inflation crisis before it was too late. Prices crept up over the course of more than a decade compared to the sudden jump in just a few months time that we're seeing today. Central banks around the world did not chiefly use their policy rates to tackle inflation by that point in history. Canada was among the first to adopt inflation targeting as a mandate in 91. Though Lee believes the Bank of Canada again waited too long to address bubbling inflation, today's reaction is years ahead of the 1980s response. The longer you postpone taking the medicine, the worse the problem gets and the tougher the problem becomes. So I have read some articles that said they should have done it last summer. That would have been, you know, and we talk about how, a lot about how, you know, the, the government tends to be reactionary on these things, not proactive, um, you know, predicting the economy is like, making a climate model. There are so many tiny little factors that all factor in and, you know, it's it's almost impossible to do. But given what was going on, that probably would have been the smartest thing. Hindsight 2020, right? This was the other thing that I found quite a bit of consistency on. Are we close to peak inflation? In the forecast this week, BMO projected that inflation would peak in the third quarter of 2022 dropping to an average of 8% in the fourth quarter and following a steady decline through 2023. To Nguyen, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, an economist with RSM Canada says that there are signs inflation could peak this summer, but what determines that is largely outside the BOC's purview. Oil prices have shown signs of decline over the past month from their peaks this past spring, and the aggressive action taken by central banks around the world should dampen consumer demand and give supply chains to get time to catch up. So this wasn't just the only article that I actually read that talked about how everyone feels like by next year, inflation is actually going to drop. And by the year after, I even read one report that said it's going to be down around three, maybe even under. Uh, again, predicting inexact science, but I do find it interesting when there's that much consensus among economists because they there is generally no consensus among economists. Uh, lastly, we have inflation is expected to hang near its multi-decade highs through the third quarter before gradually rolling over towards years. And even still, we expect inflation as measured by the core PCE deflator, 
Fed's preferred measure, to remain over the average 2% inflation target through 2023, monetary policy is expected to become far more restrictive than pre previously thought. We now project the Fed fund rate to reach 3.25 by year end and remain at that level through 2023. As higher rates cool demand side pressures and inflation moves meaningfully back towards 2%, we expect the Fed to cut interest rates back to a level more consistent with this neutral 2% rate. So I read that as so at some point next year, they will, you know, uh, probably they're going to level out and then they might even start dropping rates, which is kind of something I feel like we've been saying all along. Uh, any thoughts on that, fellas? <laughs> Aro, you go first. Okay. We've learned. So, so um, yeah, like, I mean, one thing that I was thinking as you were mentioning about, like, um, they had it, uh, they kind of got it wrong last time. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you get, like, obviously, you know, the, I forget her name, the lady that works for the, um, I think Janet Yellen, she's the treasury person or whatever, but I think she was the one that was saying, like, inflation is transitory or whatever. Um, and then she came out saying like, oh yeah, we made a mistake. But it's like, you know, like if I have a job and I and I just say like, let's say I work for the government or for, for example, and I said, oh, I, I made a mistake. I probably get fired, right? Um, but like, you know, you're in charge of the economy in a way and it's like, you made a mistake. I don't know, you're supposed to be smarter than that. So I feel like a lot of these people that are in charge of, monetary policy and government policy they're not held accountable and they just kind of like go about doing their way and reacting to what's happening mm -hmm. whereas like we they should be really you know in charge of preventing stuff like this so i don't know i get really kind of like annoyed when i see stuff like that it's like oh we made a mistake and there's no consequences like i would say regular people are suffering that. but you guys just you know mm -hmm. I would say the other side to that is that inflation is always a lag indicator, right? Like if they had, if the Bank of Canada employed a bunch of people to literally stand in grocery stores and retail outlets and track prices actively, then they could do something proactively, but they can't, right? That's just too big of a labor force to put to this type of task. Mm -hmm. So they're always measuring prices at the end of the month, whatever is published at the end of that month and putting it into a very rigorous model and algorithm to determine the best kind of outcomes and they always try to pick something that's going to be in the at the peak bell curve of possibilities right where it's the most likely outcome given the least amount of intervention for the maximum affected output that they want to produce so that's why i think when you're reading the news headlines you see that oh we got it wrong or oh this <laughs> this wasn't right this time yeah. and it's because there's a huge number of options, right? We're talking about a country of what, th what's their population? 3.6, 3.8 million people measuring the decision output of all those people and how they collectively organize together to form their communities and neighborhoods and societies and balancing that against those local economies from a federal perspective and standpoint is a monumental task. So I, I agree with kind of what Adam was saying with that, uh, with the guy from RBC and his analysis of like, look, you know, we, we've gone through this type of crisis before. The drivers for these recessionary pressures have occurred in the past and we've noticed these in the past, but we're able to respond to them much sooner, right? And it makes a lot of sense. I think lending practices are a lot tighter. Supply is a lot harder to develop comparatively to the 1970s and 80s. Um, and, you know, computer technology and the ability to actually assess these variables and come to an understanding is greatly increased. So the fact that it's such a short lived recessionary cycle or assumed to be, because we're yet to see the kind of outcome of that decision is, is a good sign. And it means that we'll likely continue to go through these types of cycles in the future as we go through these global crises, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll likely see another one to two good years before something snaps again and something has to adjust um and I, I do think oil is at kind of the heart of that right a lot of oil producers for the last two years because everyone stopped driving stopped producing barrels 
right? So you can only store oil for so long before it becomes, you either have to refine it or do something else with it, right? Before it loses its greatest value of that energy production that it gives. And since every industry and in consumer good utilizes some sort of fossil fuel to produce its good, you know, the oil company said, well, if we don't continue to supply, even though the demand is increasing, we can start increasing profit margins, what, which is what they've done over the past two years, where BP and other big oil companies have had, you know, very high bonuses. Um, but the fact that we're now seeing kind of an adjustment in that where supply is ticking up because they're, you know, mandated to do so by world governments, um, sorry, that supply will be ticking up because of that mandate, that we'll actually see kind of pricing pressure on those consumer goods likely decrease as we move into the recession. And that's probably why they're indicating such a low recessionary period um, comparatively to what we saw in the 70s and 80s, where that wasn't necessarily the case. There wasn't a pandemic interrupting that demand and supply cycle for oil. Yeah. And actually, the, the kind of the silver lining for me in, uh, in a lot of this stuff, you know, even from COVID, from the beginning of COVID, is it, for me, it really underscored um, the deficiencies of, of us moving to this kind of global economy, to outsourcing everything, to not having, you know, manufacturing, whether it's vaccines or even finding raw materials, you know, steel and, and, and things like that. And I think that there has been a, ment a, a real mentality shift within countries to say, we can't let this happen. Like, this is not, you know, COVID kind of woke people's eyes up to say this, you know, it's not a question of if it happens again, it's a question of when. And when it happens again, we need to be able to produce things domestically. We need to be able to supply what we need from a country so we can for so we can avoid these these supply chain issues. And I feel like, you know, the war in Russia is actually underscoring that mentality even more of how do we have to move forward as a country where we can still kind of function independently and not be so reliant on external factors so that our economies aren't damaged so that, you know, we don't have these, these bad outcomes. Um, so I'm kind of looking at that as a positive personally, that as we move forward, we will find solutions to these problems. Maybe we will transition to more green energy, uh, you know, all kinds of other things that we can do to not just to avoid that from, you know, from happening. Um, and in terms of what you're, I agree with what you're talking about, about that, you know, the recessionary environment, I wouldn't be surprised if we do, and I know we've talked about this a bunch, if the recession, you know, if that kind of recession kicks in faster and a little bit harder than everyone expects, and we see the Bank of Canada pivot hard and, uh, and start dropping rates even sooner than we think. Uh, you know, I know it's tough because they just, like you said, they have that reactionary view of inflation and they smack us down with it. And, you know, that's the only tool that they really have to, to control it. But I, that, that relationship between raising rates and what damage that it does to our economy is a very, very fine line um, that they have to walk and, and, and they often don't get it right. Yeah, and then I just wanted to point out too, I think all this analysis kind of shows that there's a limited buying opportunity within the market today, mm -hmm. probably for the next year to year and a half, where even with wage increases for permanent employees, we're still seeing, even though we're seeing a decrease in home prices, we're seeing a run up in rental costs. So the, so as the you know analysis stated, there is no, no kind of reduction to housing and like shelter costs, right? At the end of the day. And so I think if you're going to get into the market now and you hold something with a strong equity position, then you're going to be able to continue to have a great cash flowing property moving forward. And you're going to be starting at a much lower point in the market where you're actually going to probably have something that will be more viable from, you know, if you go to liquidate other holdings to pay off one or two properties so that they just produce cash flow when you're looking to retire, I think that'll be something that can be realized sooner comparatively to over the last two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much higher purchase prices. Agreed, agreed. It's a good time to buy, really, I think. Um, so as always, if you have any comments, any questions, throw them in the chat. We will, you know, we always love the interaction we get from all of you folks and uh, the discussion. And in the meantime, since it is, we believe, a good time to buy with the right deals, let's get to our live deals. So, Matt, I believe you have something for us as well. 
Sorry, yes. Matt, before so, you go, I, I yeah. got to jump off, get to my 12 o'clock. Uh, okay. If anybody has any inquiries about what I presented, send us an email and we'll take it from there. Sold at McCarrollteam.com. If you want a JV with a whole bunch of people and have a really kick butt 17 unit, awesome property, RO's your guy. So hit us up. So, See you. Okay. Have a good one, guys. All right. So we're saying goodbye to RO and hello to another live deal. So this is a Lansdale uh, single family home that would be converted into a duplex. So this would be a two bed, uh, two two bed units, uh, one on the main floor and one on the upper floor. The nice thing about this property is I think there's a lot of good long term potential. Um, and I do like the amount of parking immediately available on the front lawn. So this is down the side of the home. There is a addition at the back. So currently it's set up as a two bedroom on the main with one of the bedrooms being at the back here and there's two bedrooms upstairs. So this leads you to the value add that I think is really great, which is the huge garage. So this garage is massive. So this is the inside of it. Mm -hmm. So I have some notes here. It's at 27 by 21 feet. So that comes out to just around about 560 square feet. I took very quick measurements when I was going through on the showing, but uh, the ceiling height is ridiculous. So your height um, to that steel I-beam that you can see sticking out is about nine foot, three inches. And then to the rafters behind it, it is 10 foot, eight inches tall. So this would be a really good potential ADU conversion down the line. So this is in D zoning in the Lansdale area. So we're just over here. So this is kind of central Hamilton and we are just kind of in between King and Maine for this one. So we'll show the interior of the property and we'll get through uh, some numbers. Like Aro, I'm gonna be doing some quick adjustments too. But uh, to start, this is the main entry that you see from the first photo of the exterior of the home. So this is the entryway into the main floor and then this runs straight up to your second floor. So it'd be very easy to block the side of this as the main floor has an entrance through the back. So you'd have two dedicated entrances. It needs some love and updates. It is forced air. The furnace is about 15 years old. Um, this is the second floor kitchen area here. It needs to be ripped out and redone. So it's an extensive bit of rental work to be done. And I wanted to kind of play around with the numbers so I could show you kind of what's going on here. So. I'm just gonna swap my sharing here. All right, so can you guys see the Excel spreadsheet? Yep. Sweet. So this property is currently listed at 619,000. I think we can likely get it for about 588,000, which would be 95% of its current list price. Uh, we would have a total of two units and we would be borrowing at 4.5% uh, with 20% down and eight months of carrying it. So that would bring our total cost to 152,000 free rental. So if you did a minor reno and just brought it up to the standard where it could be duplex uh, at 150, you'd be in it with appliances for 180 that you would fund yourself. Um, if we increase this number to 250, then obviously we're gonna go up in our uh, renovation costs, which will bring up our after repair value as well. So looking at that, if we were to borrow against the property again and refi, we wouldn't be able to take out a huge amount of cash, unfortunately. So we'd be looking at about 58% to maintain a slightly positive position. Um, give me one sec here, because I've got to do one more adjustment. So it's going to be 56% to maintain a slightly positive cash flow. There we go, of $15 net per month with all your expenses. So the reason I wanted to show this one as a burr first is because I think it's it's viable to do. I don't think it's the best thing you could do. And so what I wanted to show is if you do the reno, how good the cash flow potential could be just on its own, keeping the original mortgage cost in place. So at four and a half percent, it brings your monthly payment down about seven hundred dollars, and it allows you to cash flow five hundred and fifty three dollars a month with all your expenses once it's rented. So this gives you a cash a modified cash on cash return with principal payment 
consideration of 3.2%. Um, but if you take out your vacancy and repairs, you're at 1,046 a month. And if you self-manage, you're at 1,169 per month. And this is less than uh, 600,000 to get into a project. So if you are just starting and don't have a huge amount of um, wiggle room in terms of what you can afford, but you have a decent amount of capital or have joint venture partners to help put in some money, then that's kind of something you can achieve. So that's why I like that one. Interesting. Yeah, I'm a big fan of gigantic garages like that. Uh, there's a lot of potential and they really are value add. Rent them out as is for, you know, three to three, three to five hundred bucks a month and then eventually convert them uh, once you do that. Uh, incidentally, my hearing to get with the uh, what is it? Not the landlord tenant, the land tribunal. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that do know, I do have a duplex with a, a garage. I got rejected by the committee, even though the city supported it fully. I have documents saying the city 100% supported me converting it into an ADU and five of the six committee members decided that it was not a good idea. So we went to the landlord, uh, the land, land tribunal. I keep calling it landlord tenant board. The land tribunal, uh, my hearing is tomorrow. Um, my designer is quite confident it will go through because it is a provincial mandate and the city wants it. So hopefully that will happen. I will keep you all posted on that. If uh, Matt's deal interests you as well, if you want to get into the ADU, obviously we have experience with it. Uh, hit us up at sold at And uh, I will uh, just show you my property very quickly. I went with a very simple buy and hold, single family, proven strategy. Uh, this one has been on the market for a while as well. I like these ones that have been up for quite a bit because... Obviously, the seller is hopefully going to mo be motivated. They've already price dropped once. It's in a really nice area, not far from the harbor front area. Actually, let me see. Is it on the map? Uh, no, I think that is ROs. There we go. So you see it's uh, in this area, close to the harbor front, close to the GO station, not far from where the LRT is going to be. Amazing appreciation area. Um, I believe there are pictures. It is actually um, renovated as well. The layout's a little interesting. I'll say that, you know, some of the bedrooms are small, but it is a really nice, clean, ready to go single family with three beds. I believe there's laundry, if I'm not mistaken, in there too. Got a little backyard, dishwasher, um, ready to go. So just looking at it as a single family buy and hold, they're at 475. I put 450 in as the purchase price. Again, uh, I feel like there are deals to be had. Doesn't mean you're always going to get under. Sometimes the price drop actually makes them appropriately priced. 475 is not completely out to lunch on this, but it is a semi-detached and uh, it does, you know, the basement, it's not a full basement either. So 2,500 for rents with the pressure, upward pressure on rents, that may even be a little conservative for that area, but I like to do them a little conservatively. You're going to be paying your water, your, your sewer, electricity is on the tenants. The water heater, I believe, is rented. The taxes are nice and low, only to about just over two grand. Your insurance is 100. Everything else is going to be paid for. I'm a big fan of self-managing single family places. There's not really much that you generally have to do, especially with a place like this that has been renovated. So buying it at 450, I put it at 5.5 just to build in some safety, you know, a bit of a safety valve if we do have another rate increase and it is going to cash flow about 80 bucks a month. So if you can get another hundred or $200 a month in rent, which is not out of the realm of possibility, you're suddenly, you know, almost 200 or 300 bucks in cash flow. And as always, we're looking future value, 6% over five years. At some point, I believe that we will get back to that nine to 12% might take a year or two, but over five years, uh, I think 6% is reasonable. You're going to have almost 30K in mortgage pay down and you will have uh, over a quarter of a million in equity in the property. Great strategy. So where a lot of people start. Um, I do have a lot of discussions with people or friends of clients who don't think that investment is doable. And once you kind of walk them through the basis, basics and take away the fear take away, you know, there's always risk, but you can mitigate it as much as possible by doing numbers correctly, um, you know, and take that plunge. 
very often you will not regret it. Um, sometimes you do, but often I find that when I've spoken with clients, not necessarily my past clients, they have bought something um, where they used a realtor that didn't understand investment. And they told them they could do this, this, and this with the property, and they couldn't. And they don't find out until they've had to go through all kinds of permitting hell or been caught by the city or had to evict someone. So working with people that know what they're talking about is key. So uh, as always, folks, it's been a pretty quiet crew this uh, this week, but we always appreciate you coming out. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if buyers have buyers have stepped out of the market. I, I, I'm not sure about the chat activity. Sometimes it's just a quiet crew. Personally, I think that this is the perfect time to really be looking. I think there's deals. Um, I feel like buyer activity from an investment perspective for the last month quieted down because everyone was sitting on their hands waiting to see what happened with the rate hike. And once we got that, that clarity around the rate hike, I said it last week, now you just recalibrate, do your numbers properly, understand, you know, what, you know, now your, now your costs are a little more certain and you can do numbers moving forward at that. Um, yeah. Gustavo, just send us a message on sold at mccarrollteam.com. Um, actually it, it, all of the live deals will be on our investor page. If you're not part of our VIP list or our buyer list, go to mccarrollteam.ca and go to, uh, you know, lo log in or sign up for our buyer list. And you will get a weekly email with all of these and other hot deals that we found because we're always looking. There's always multiple deals. And if there's uh, no other questions or comments, uh, I think we'll bid you farewell. Anything, Matt, from you, parting? Nope, that's about it. Uh, I would say from my deal, there is uh, the listing agent just emailed me saying there has been some activity and they might have an offer coming in over the weekend. So if you would like to make a move on that one, it's got to be sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, otherwise, that's about it. Happy investing. Mm -hmm. Follow us. Yep. Do all the things that Adam told you just to do. Yeah, there we go. We we uh, we really love uh, love our community. We really love what we're building here. As always, if you have friends thinking about it or you've been talking about it, let us know. Uh, we also, I do have another seller. If you're thinking of selling in the next year, um, we I, I do a seller workshop that will be in two weeks on a Wednesday. And until then, happy investing. <laughs>